Hi, my name is Kip Thorne, and what inspires me is communicating science to non-scientists. This is why I would like you to join me from the 18th to the 21st of January at Congreso Futuro 2021. In 1968, when I was a very young professor at Caltech in Pasadena, California, I had brought to visit me from the Soviet Union, from Russia, a another young professor working in the same field, a friend of mine named Igor Novikov. And Igor and I collaborated on research together, despite the fact that it was the depths of the Cold War, uh, over a period of a few weeks. And one evening after a very long working day, thinking about equations and ideas in physics, uh, we went to see a movie in Hollywood. It was 2001, A Space Odyssey. It had just been released. And let me remind you of the movie through this recent trailer. At the end of the movie, Igor and I walked out of the theater and were completely silent for about 10 minutes. We were both stunned by the science that was so inspiring, uh, the science that was so impeccably done, and by the film itself, the superb film depicting science in a science fiction setting. In fact, the movie went on to inspire tens of millions of people about science around the world. And its great success was due in large measure to the fact that it was a collaboration between Stanley Kubrick, a great filmmaker, and Arthur C. Clarke, a physicist and a great uh, writer who uh, understood physics very deeply and embedded physics into this movie from the outset. In September 1980, some years later, I had a telephone call from Carl Sagan, a friend of mine who was an astronomer and also a filmmaker, and he asked me if I would like to have a blind date with another filmmaker named Linda Oakes to go to the premiere of his new television series, Cosmos. I was very pleased to accept that we went. Linda and I enjoyed ourselves, but there was no spark of romance between us. We just went on to become very close friends, Linda, Carl, and I. In 1985, I had another telephone call from Carl he told me that he and Linda were working together on a movie and he was writing together with Annie Dryan, his wife, they were writing a novel uh, to underlie the movie, the story for the movie. <clears throat> the name of the movie and the novel was Contact. And he told me that in this uh, novel and movie, he had the heroine Eleanor Arroway travel through a black hole to the planet that was orbiting around the star Vega, about 25 million light years from Earth. He said, I realize I may be in trouble. I'm not a great expert on black holes. I would like you to help me out. I told him, unfortunately, it's not possible to travel through a black hole. I explained why. A black hole, although it may look like just a black sphere, it's actually made from warped space and warped time. And you can understand that by taking an equatorial slice, a two-dimensional surface through the equator of the black hole, and it, that is actually embedded in a higher dimensional space called the bulk that surrounds our universe. Uh, and uh, it bends down in the bulk. So that the circumference around that black hole is small compared to pi times the diameter. And time slows as you near the horizon and at, at the edge of the black hole, which we call a horizon. And inside the horizon, time flows dra downward, dragging anything that falls into the black hole with that downward flow of time to a singularity at the center of the black hole, which destroys everything that falls into it. And so you're not going to get to another part of the universe. You're going to get die in a singularity if you fall into a black hole. I told him there was hope that there is something called a wormhole and people didn't know much about wormholes except for physicists like me at that time. He should send El Eleanor Arroway through a wormhole instead of a black hole. And then I explained what a wormhole is. If you begin with our universe and the solar system, such as Saturn out here, 
and a center of some distant galaxy, Andromeda, or the neighborhood of Vega. Uh, and those are very far apart. But if you bend in the bulk, in this higher dimension, you bend our universe around, it may be only a few kilometers between uh, the vicinity of Earth and that, uh, uh, and that vicinity of Vega, or center of a distant galaxy. And if you go across the bulk, and there could be a structure called a wormhole that reaches across the bulk, something that was first conceived using Einstein's relativity theory by Albert Einstein himself back in 1935. And that, uh, if, for example, light could go from that uh, distant region up through the camera, uh, up through the wormhole to a camera. And so the camera would see a wormhole that looked, for example, like that. The problem I told him is that with all the wormholes that we've ever studied as physicists, they implode so rapidly that nothing can go through. But I thought maybe it would be possible to find somebody who would fold a wormhole open. And so I began to ask the question as a physicist, stimulated by Carl and the movie Contact, do the laws of physics permit a very advanced civilization to build wormholes and to hold them open instead of having them implode, hold them open so that you could do rapid interstellar travel through the wormhole like uh, Carl wanted to do in his film. And in fact, very quickly, it became clear that you can, if you can have the right kind of stuff to put inside the wormhole, you can prevent it from fall, being, uh, from imploding. And to understand this, I send a light beam into the wormhole. It goes through the wormhole and it's originally converging. And then after, after it goes through the wormhole, it's diverging. So that means that the wormhole defocuses a light beam, which is just the opposite to what happens if a light beam, a giant light beam, were to go past the sun, the gravitational pull of the sun would focus that light beam. Now we know that that focusing is due to the matter inside the sun, which gravitates. And so what's required to hold a wormhole open is a material that anti-gravitates, that repels gravitationally. Uh, and that requires that by contrast with the sun's matter that has positive mass and energy, that you have to put something inside the wormhole that has negative energy, we call this exotic matter. And so in this way, my conversation with Carl about the film that he was working on triggered research by me and others on exotic matter. And we soon realized that in fact, you can make exotic matter in the laboratory in tiny amounts by manipulating something that I won't discuss precisely what it is, but something called vacuum fluctuations, tiny fluctuations of electricity and magnetism that exist after you've removed all the electromagnetic electricity and magnetism that you can possibly remove. Those fine, tiny fluctuations that are left behind, if you then manipulate them, you can make exotic matter. Well, contact also triggered then us, me, and two of my students, Mike Morris and Ulvi Yurtseever, to start thinking about time travel in a serious sort of a way, because I knew then that if I had a, a wormhole mouth and my wife, Carolee, had the other mouth, and if I send her out at high speed, near the speed of light, in a rocket, and she turns around, comes back at near the speed of light, that uh, relativity insists that she will ha age hardly at all while I have become an old man. And so looking out through space as she arrives back home, she sees me very old. But if we hold hands through the wormhole during the entire trip and we look at each other's watches, we see they tick at the same rate. So looking through the, worm, through the wormhole, she sees me as a young man. That means that if I were to go out uh, when she is back on Earth and uh, to her and go inside through her wormhole mouth uh, as a young man, as an old man, I would go in and I would meet my younger self. So this wormhole has been turned into a time machine. And, it was quite startling to me when I realized that, uh, uh, me and my students, when we realized that this uh, was possible according to the laws of relativity. When we published a paper, a technical paper describing this, my dear friend Igor Novikov in Moscow immediately telephoned me. He said, if you can work on time travel and wormholes, which I, all my friends think is, as physicists think is not a respectful thing to work on as a physicist, well then so can I. And so that in fact triggered him 
and many others for the first time to begin working on uh, on wormholes and time travel. And it all began with uh, talking to Carl about his movie. And what have we learned? Well, one thing we have learned is that at the moment that it is created, uh, the, the, the moment that the wormhole becomes a time machine, it may self-destruct. Uh, and they're basically the reason is that the same vacuum flux, the kinds of vacuum fluctuations that may be holding the wormhole open, uh, what, the moment it becomes a time machine, they can go circulating through the wormhole and back through space over and over and over again, piling up on themselves, creating a gigantic explosion. This was something that I figured out together with a postdoc of mine from Korea, Sun Wan Kim. But there was a question, is the explosion really strong enough to destroy the wormhole? And it became evident after long discussions between me and my dear friend, Stephen Hawking, that we don't know the answer. The answer is held tightly in the grip of a set of physical laws that we don't yet understand called the laws of quantum gravity. But Hawking, Stephen conjectured that, worm, that time machines will always self-destruct when you try to activate them. He calls this his chronology protection conjecture, uh, keeping protecting uh, the uni universe from having backward time travel, thereby protecting uh, historians from having to deal with rewriting history. Uh, and all of it, again, was triggered by contact, by my discussions with Carl Sagan as a filmmaker, uh, also incidentally an astronomer, about his movie Contact. To October 2005, Carl sadly had died of cancer and uh, Linda Oakes was looking for a new collaborator. She telephoned me up and said, uh, would you like to brainstorm with me for a movie? And so I said, yes, I would love to. And so we uh, brainstormed together and conceived the ideas for a movie called, that would be called Interstellar uh, with Einstein's relativity laws, warp, space, and time embedded into the very fabric of the movie right from the beginning before it ever got into the hands of a screenwriter. In January 2007, Linda, who then had, we had sold an option to make the movie to Paramount, and that Paramount then later uh, uh, worked together with uh, Warner Brothers on the movie. In January 2007, uh, she and Paramount brought on board Jonathan, or Jonah as he's called, Nolan, a young man, to write the screenplay. He read many relevant science books that I fed to him. He brainstormed with me about the science and he wrote, went through three drafts of the screenplay. And then we brought on board, Linda brought on board Christopher Nolan, Chris, to uh, direct the movie and his wife, Emma Thomas, to be the lead producer. Linda had been the creative producer who had got the movie going as producer. And I, in my first meeting with Chris, I said, look, I would love for this uh, movie to follow some guidelines that nothing in the film will violate firmly established laws of physics or our firmly established knowledge of the universe. And that all speculations about poorly understood physical laws in the universe will arise from real science. Chris said, uh, I eagerly embrace these uh, guidelines so long as it does not get in the way of making a great movie. And it didn't. And so uh, we really followed this uh, in almost all respects. Hey, Chris then brainstormed with me through three more drafts of the screenplay. The final screenplay and the movie preserved Linda's and my science vision. They changed the story and the characters almost completely. So Interstellar is really the Nolan's movie and not ours. In May 2013, uh, I, Chris phoned me and sa said, I'm going to send Paul Franklin over to talk with you about the movie. He will be the supervisor of visual effects for Interstellar. And so Paul came over, we talked, I was very impressed by him. I uh, discovered that he had already won one Academy Award for the visual effects that he uh, and his studio and his company called Double Negative had done for Christopher Nolan's movie Inception. And in fact, Paul would go on, he and his team, and me as part of his team, to win the Academy Award also for the visual effects in Interstellar. So I've now told you about some of the people that I worked with on Interstellar. I'm going to let them talk to you about me. We are still pioneers. We've barely begun. 
Our greatest accomplishments cannot be behind us. Because our destiny lies above us. The initial impetus for the, the project had been to say, why not examine real possibilities? Why not actually look at the real science there? Luckily, we had Kip, and Kip is the foremost authority on all things gravitational. The warping of space inside here scatters some of it back, flight scattering off of the surface of a rippled ocean. Neither wormholes nor black holes have been depicted in any Hollywood movie in the way that they actually would appear. This is the first time the depiction began with Einstein's general relativity equations. The visual effects department under Paul Franklin and everybody at Double Negative took Kip's mathematical data and they created real visual representations of what a black hole is meant to look like. The collaboration has produced visualization of things which nobody had ever managed to do before. In the movie, Brand, uh, Amelia Brand, played by Anne Hathaway, and Cooper, uh, played by Matthew McConaughey, uh, they travel through a wormhole. And this is an image of the wormhole that we created for this movie. Uh, the No image of the wormhole had been shown in the movie Contact. So this was the first accurate image of a, uh, of a wormhole that had appeared in any movie. They travel through that wormhole and on the other side, they uh, meet the black hole Gargantua. And this image of Gargantua became, after the movie was out, sort of the iconic image for black holes for a number of years thereafter. And why does it look like that? I mean, well, that doesn't look at all like you would have thought a black hole would look like. And the reason is that this black hole is surrounded by an accretion disk, a hot disk of gas, rather like Saturn's rings. And if you have a camera over here, just above the plane of the accretion disk, a light ray coming off the upper back face of the disk is pulled by the black hole's gravity up over and bent back down to the camera. So it looks to the camera like that upper back face is up here in the air above the black hole, which explains that piece of the image. And then a light ray coming from the bottom back face of the black hole to the camera uh, looks to the camera like it is down below the black hole. That explains this part of the image. And then a light ray from the front uh, of the disk, uh, of the accretion disk, uh, travels to the camera and creates this image of the crossbar. So a very simple explanation of how that image comes to be. In 2018, radio astronomers made an actual photograph of a giant black hole in the center of the galaxy, M87. And they, they did this with a set of radio telescopes that were spaced all around the world, uh, and all the data were put together uh, and combined together uh, so that it was as though you had a radio telescope the size of the entire Earth. And uh, the that then was used through a lot of uh, work uh, combining the images on a com on a computer to produce this image of the uh, black hole in the galaxy M87. And from the details of the image and knowing how far away that uh, galaxy M87 is, uh, they inferred that this black hole weighs six billion times more than the sun weighs. Now, why the difference? This is what uh, Gargantua's black hole looks like. That's what M87 looks like, they're rather different. You see the shadow of the black hole itself in both cases, but you have uh, this crossbar over here. Well, why the differences? Uh, Oliver James, my colleague at Double Negative, at DNEG, uh, said, look, if you had the camera, it's just above the uh, plane of the disc you're looking in, you see the, uh, the uh, front of the disc like that is a bar across in front of the uh, black hole's shadow. Uh, and then you move the camera up so it's looking down on the black hole. This is what you get. You then fuzz out the image because the radio astronomers do not have very good angular resolution. And the image becomes very much like what the radio astronomers have seen. Now, we actually had a lot of trouble making the images for interstellar because for a rather simple reason. 
If I have two different light rays coming to the camera, bringing me an image of uh, what is at the base of the light rays when they intersect the disc, if they're coming in very close together so that they're carrying the image of adjacent pixels in the camera's picture, because the gravity of the black hole is so much stronger, close to the black hole and farther away, they wind up coming back to very distant uh, pieces of the black hole's uh, disk. And so naturally, it's impossible to get a smooth image if these are carrying adjacent pixels, but they come from pieces of the disk that are so far apart. And so that was a problem that we had to face. And we so therefore invented a whole new method of making images where we propagated the light through light beams instead of light rays. I won't go into the details. The details, which were worked out by Oliver James, the chief scientist at Double Negative and I, and then the uh, paintings of all of the of the accretion disk and uh, uh, everything else astrophysical were done by a team of artists uh, that uh, was led by Eugenie von Tunzelman, and then Paul Franklin, who got the Academy Award on behalf of all of us, uh, oversaw everything and organized it all. So we published the details then in a physics journal. And uh, that method of making images is now being used by astrophysicists around the world uh, to make much better images than they could before when they're dealing with black holes. And is being used in Hollywood uh, to, uh, when uh, nowadays when one has to make images again around black holes. And we actually use that to go in and learn some new physics about the uh, gravitational lensing, the bending of light rays around black holes, and the kinds of images that you get. So what Oliver, James, and I did was we placed a very dense field of stars behind the black hole. And when we took our camera and moved it around the black hole in orbit and watched what happened to the images due to this bending of all the light rays, and it is really quite startling. This is something called an Einstein ring. Physicists knew about that. What we didn't really know is that inside this ring, you have pairs of stellar images created in pairs and they destroy each other in pairs. Continual creation and destruction of pairs of images of, of a star. And similarly down here, there's another Einstein ring where that happens. Another Einstein ring in here, another one in here, an infinite number of Einstein rings where pairs of images of stars are created and destroyed due to this bending of light rays. It's really quite startling. And that was one of the things that we announced to physicists uh, in our publication. Now, in the movie, uh, Cooper and Brand go down to Miller's planet, which is in uh, orbit around the black hole. And Christopher Nolan, when he was working on the screenplay, said to me, I want it to be true that one hour on Miller's planet is equivalent to seven years on Earth. So they go down, they're down there for a few hours and come back and something like 21 years have been passed on Earth. And I said to him, well, that's crazy. That's not possible. We know that time slows near the horizon of a black hole, but any planet that is near enough to the black hole that there's that much slowing of time is gonna fall right into the horizon immediately. There's no way it can be held out by its centrifugal forces. Chris by then knew me well. He said, you go in and do a real calculation and come back and tell me that's really how the calculation works out. So I went, I did the real calculation and I found to my surprise that if uh, Gargantua spins rapidly enough, it drags space around itself into a whirling motion. And that whirling motion is big enough that it adds additional centrifugal force to the planet to enable the planet to stay out and not fall into the black hole. And uh, it was quite, quite startling to me uh, to discover that Chris had been right. It was possible, uh, possible after all. And then in the movie, the audience saw this in a very graphic way where Cooper said to his daughter before he goes on this journey, he says, I may go near a black hole. And when I uh, come, uh, time for me will slow down. And so it may be that when I come back out from near the black hole, that uh, you have grown up to be the same age as I am now, and I have aged hardly at all anymore. And in fact, that's what happens. Cooper goes down uh, onto Miller's planet. They're there for about three hours, comes back and sees a video of his daughter 
who is uh, now grown up to become a theoretical physicist trying to understand gravity uh, and uh, uh, it's the same age as he was. And near the end of the movie, he goes down near the black hole again, uh, comes back and meets his daughter. His daughter is now in her late 90s, a very emotional scene, and he is still very young. And it is uh, a, just a graphic depiction that uh, grips the audience of the how time can be very different. It can be relative, much slower near a black hole than it is back here on Earth. Now, I, as we were working on the movie, uh, Christopher Nolan said to me, he said, we bring Cooper and Bran uh, out to Gargantua through a wormhole. I want to send them back by some other method. Uh, and uh, what can we do? And I suggested to him, I said, maybe the best interesting way to do it is to carry them back on the surface of a four dimensional sphere that travels through the bulk above our universe. And I explained to him that uh, up above our universe in the bulk, the distance back from Earth, from Gargantua to Earth is quite short. It's shorter than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, whereas down inside our universe, that distance is about 10 billion light years, enormously long. And so Chris said, no, I like the idea, but I'm going to put uh, Cooper in the three dimensional face of a four-dimensional cube called a tesseract. And he knew all about tesseracts. Chris, in fact, knows a heck of a lot of science, largely having learned it by browsing the web. But he knew all about tesseracts. He said, I'm going to use a tesseract for this. And so, in fact, that's how it worked out. And in the movie, you see Cooper having been scooped up by the tesseract is very disoriented and doesn't realize that the tesseract is carrying him back from Gargantua to the earth. Uh, he screams in his disorientation. And uh, then you uh, uh, move into the interstellar's climax. In the interstellar's climax, much of it is inside this tesseract after the tesseract has returned to Earth and is docked in the higher dimension beside the bedroom of Cooper's daughter. And here you see a bit of that climax. The climax is actually very puzzling to most viewers of the movie. And uh, in fact, that's what uh, Christopher Nolan intended. He said to me early on when we were beginning to talk about the climax of the movie, he said that I have always been an admirer of Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001 A Space Odyssey and particularly of the ending, which seems so mysterious until you really think about it. Uh, it's very mysterious. I mean, I want the climax of our movie to similarly seem very mysterious, be hard to understand. He said, I know you're going to write a book about the science in this movie, I'll invite you to explain the climax, the ending of the movie uh, in your book. <clears throat> so for those of you who uh, have seen Interstellar and have had trouble understanding the end of the uh, movie, just go buy my book and read it. It will explain the end, the end. Now, the movie itself is tremendously inspiring to people about science. And that was what we intended. And then my book about the science of interstellar can educate those of you who are actually interested in really understanding the science, can educate you about the science. Interstellar, in fact, has inspired tens of millions of people about science around the world. It has sold more than 100 million tickets, uh, and uh, it has been tremendously inspirational in the same way as Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey was. Where to from here? Well, uh, a year or two before Stephen, my dear friend Stephen Hawking died, he and I and Linda Obst uh, wrote the treatment for another science fiction movie that contains very different science from what is in Interstellar. Uh, and that movie is moving along. It might never get made, but there's a very good chance it will come out in the next few years. Uh, and if it does, I expect it will be as inspiring about science uh, as were 
uh, Interstellar and Contact in 2001, A Space Odyssey, and that it may act back and have an influence on science as well in the same way as uh, some of these movies have had back action, big impact on scientific research. And I thank you. <laughs>